everyone. I'm Charles Payne. On behalf of Mike Perry, the director of the Army, Army Heritage Center Foundation and our staff, I'd like to, to welcome, like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Tonight, of course, our presentation is being given by Dr. Robert Jefferson from the University of New Mexico. And it seems like a, a terrifically relevant and uh, current topic that I think we'll all enjoy. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jefferson. Good evening. I would like to thank uh, Charles Payne and Mike Perry and the Army Heritage Foundation Center uh, for uh, inviting me to speak with you this evening. Um, I'm an associate professor of history at the University of New Mexico. Uh, I specialize in African-American history, race and disability studies, and 20th century United States history. I'm also the recent author of Brothers in Valor, Battlefield Stories of the 89 African-Americans awarded the Medal of Honor, and that was published in uh, 2018. And I'm also the author of Fighting for Hope, African-American Troops of the 93rd Infantry Division in World War II and Post-War America. That was published in 2008. My next book recovers the social experiences of American GIs in the creation and development of the Army's officer candidate schools during the Second World War. This evening, I wish to open my presentation with, uh, please advance to the next slide. And what I have in front of you is a Getty Short um, news short that covered the 92nd uh, Division's uh, entry into Genoa in, in 1945. Could you play that? Could you play that clip? Yeah, it's on the bottom there. Yeah, I'm just having a. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Now I open with that clip because it is, uh, it is significant for many reasons. First of all, it's one of, the few, it's one of the few newsreels that captured black soldiers in action, uh, the soldiers who served with the US 92nd Infantry Division and their encounters with uh, European civilian populations during the latter stages of the war. Uh, but most of all, I think it gives us a clue, um, gives us some, some significant clues into the post-world uh, the post world that was coming into being uh, at the time. As many scholars have pointed out, um, World War II signaled a turning point in America's commitment to racial equality. As black GIs fought in Europe, Asia, and, and the Pacific, very few of them were uh, failed to, to be oblivious to this, uh, this new world that was taking shape around them. For many of them who wore the nation's uniform, uh, the forces of fascism and Nazism and American segregationist um, policies were two sides of the same coin. And at the same time, many uh, black organizations like the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People uh, and leaders like uh, noted scholars like Rayford uh, Logan and also the uh, NAACP's executive secretary, um, Walter White, not to mention also the black press at that time they raised their voices pointing out the, the paradox of fighting in uniform against basically the, these policies of ethnic intolerance that were being expressed by the Axis uh, Alliance while drawing a connections uh, between American racist uh, rhetoric as well as practice abroad as well as at home. Since the 1944 publication of uh, Logan's What the Negro Wants, and also White's 1945 travelogue uh, titled A Rising Wind, historians have largely um, echoed 
their observations linking local politics and global civil rights. In this presentation, I want to add to that existing literature that, it, that explores the degree to which international global concerns and domestic struggles for civil rights were inextricably linked together during the actual fighting itself. I explore the patrolling uh, operations of the African-American soldiers of the 92nd Infantry Division in the Northern Apennine Mountains and their interaction with Italian civilians uh, during the winter and spring months of 1944 and 1945. I contend that the, the threatening uh, situations that Black GIs and, and Italian villagers faced in the region gave rise to new understandings of race class and ethnicity. Born at the very height of the intense fighting, rare moments of social learning occurred that captured and held the imaginations of the combatants and non-combatants alike as to how deeply connected the international struggle for human rights and the African-American fight for equality were linked to a much broader and a longer civil rights movement. You have scholars now uh, over the last decade or so, talking about the, lo the longer arc of the civil rights movement. Well, what I want to do is to try to add to that and complicate it, it, complicate it uh, a little bit. What led me to this project involving the racial encounters between Black soldiers and, in, 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 and uh, Italian civilians is the genealogy of Italian racial ideology from 1920 to 1945. For example, as I was researching the thoughts and activities of African-American GIs in Europe, particularly in Italy, I found myself asking, how is it that Italians had moved from embracing uh, fascist racist ideology in the 1920s to opposing Nazi Germany and racist ideology in the waning years of the Second World War? And then I found myself also asking the question, and how and to what extent did their evolving conceptions of race inform their initial encounters with Black GIs who were fighting in Italy at the time? Those questions were, they intrigued me most of all because this, this idea of this evolving, uh, this evolving Black GI during the war in itself had two parts to it. And I thought the first part of it was they're realizing that this war was much, much larger than the, the unfolding civil rights movement. But then also, they also, I think a part of that worldview was expanded to, to embrace the changing conceptions of race that were occurring abroad. So I want to begin my presentation with the, 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 the arrival of the U.S. 92nd Infantry Division's 370th Infantry in Italy. Soldiers with the 370th Infantry Regiment, Regimental Combat Team arrived in Naples, Italy in late July of 1944. Please advance to slide number three. Yeah, bear with me, it's just frozen. Okay. frozen yeah it's, well it, it, does, it does that occasionally I'll, I'll keep trying to okay it, well what you would see in front of you is a map that shows the areas where the 92nd division was that was uh active along with their ordeal at soma colonia uh that i'll discuss later as the nearly 4,000 gis marched into in the position along the, the southern bank of the arno river they expressed they express high hopes, as well as a quiet confidence. The enlisted men and, all, and officers had just been reorganized after enduring several months of intense and rigorous training that generally and quickly molded them into a physically toughened, uh, highly skilled uh, fighting unit. Not only that, but each man had been carefully selected by combat team leader, Colonel Raymond Sherman. After undergoing a, a battlefield orientation program with the 85th Infantry uh, Division, 
The 370th uh, combat team moved into a pre preparatory position located 30 miles east of the Tyrrhenian uh, Sea. The purpose of this was to provide a defensive cover for General Mark Clark's uh, Fifth Army's uh, projected advance across the mountainous uh, plains of the Ligurian uh, coast in order to penetrate the, Im the, the, the impregnable uh, German defensive fortifications that rest rested on the slope of the Northern Apennine Mountains. Please advance the slide to, to, to slide four. Here's a slide showing elements of the unit marching through one of the towns that resided along the Apennine Mountains during this period. And as you can see, they're what they're doing is as they're advancing, um, they, they're they taking note also of the terrain around them. Um, and they're also starting to think about, okay, what is this, what is this, what is this fighting going to be all about? Now, for the newly arrived tro Black troops and also the veteran American uh, units that were already serving in the area, the timing of the projected uh, offensive was of great importance. The winter season lay just beyond the horizon, bringing with it the seemingly endless days of mud and snow that threatened to undoubtedly subdue an Allied advance until the, the following spring. So they were advancing in order to try to get ahead of that weather, so to speak. And as the men with the, the regimental team soon learned, the task of protecting the Fifth Army's flank and minimizing the, the enemy's presence in the area was easier said than done. In late August of 1944, patrolling infantrymen drew intense uh, enemy fire when they advanced uh, forward along the line and the dense fog and confusion about the direction of the German forces induced many of the men to, to fire indiscriminately on their own outposts. What's more, a company from the unit faced heavy resistance from German patrols and enemy mines when they attempted to seize Mount Pisano and also M Mount Albano, two of the, the allied event, uh, objectives in the Arno uh, Plains area. By the end of September of that year, the 370th uh, combat team had taken uh, control of Mount Pisano and advanced well beyond the hi of highway number 12, occupying much of the coastal sector. But the unit paid a very heavy price for their efforts for, because 19 men were killed in, in action and nearly 250 uh, servicemen were wounded in the process. Little did the men of the 370th realize it at the time, but the worst was yet to come. As two battalions of the unit attempted to drive toward Mount Koalo, several battle-hardened battalions of the, of the Jagger uh, Regiment awaited them, strategically positioned behind defensive wire uh, entanglements along the stiff uh, southern cliffs of the mountains, enemy forces enjoyed the distinct advantage of terrain and weather that hampered the movement of black infantrymen and other U allied troops uh, at every turn. As battalions of the, of the combat team struggled to ford the onrushing waters uh, of the, the Cerevezo uh, River, enemy artillerymen rain shells on them, causing the men to withdraw and to reorganize in an area located far beyond its assembly area. By the time they reached the crest of the mountain and the rest of the division landed in Italy, enemy artillery and mortar fire had posed such a tremendous uh, challenge to the enlisted men and officers in the unit that they began to slowly realize that the attack on Mount Koala would re require all of their thoughts and energies in the coming month, days and months. So they were fighting not only the, a fierce enemy force, but they, they were also trying to get ahead of that weather that they saw coming. So in the weeks leading up to the winter months of, of that year, echelons of the division moved into the Sergio uh, Valley sector, where its frontline companies began to stage for an offensive against German forces in the region. Attached to Indian, British, and also South African units, the foot soldiers received the mission of minimizing the enemy strong points in the vicinity of Luca. Positioned along a six mile front, platoons assembled north of Soma Colonia where they ran headlong into an enemy force 
composed of the veteran Austro-German uh, Mittenwald uh, Battalion. After enduring hours of fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the streets, Black GIs slowly advanced before being forced to withdraw from the village. In many cases, they were fighting door to door, and this situation was so fluid for the onrushing black soldiers that one of its uh, one of its uh, one of its participants in this fighting, Lieutenant John Fox, who was a forward observer with one of the units, called an artillery fire on an area that was located only sixty yards from his own uh, position. Please advance it to slide five, please. This is a picture of John, of, of John R. Fox. Fox was a resident of, of Cincinnati, Ohio, prior to the unit's deployment to Italy. And he had a, he had a story career. And I think uh, for historians looking at uh, basically men who served with this unit, Fox epitomized the grit and the grime of basically th those men in that particular unit. He went on at that time to distinguish himself in action, of which he was, he was recognized posthumously for the Distinguished Service Cross and earned the admiration of his fellow soldiers who survived that harrowing uh, day. Uh, as Danette Herod, who was a, a GI serving with the unit, later recalled, he was there in, in action when basically Fox called the, he basically called in this artillery fire on his own position. And it was so stirring for him because when years later, I, when I met him, uh, I met him there basically at Carlisle, he talked about it in great detail. And, and the way he talked about it was that Fox, when Fox was questioned as to whether the mission was safe to fire on it, he he emphatically answered, fire on it, there's more of them than us. And those were the lasting things that Herod said ab about Fox's demeanor at that time. He was a no-nonsense, basically, officer. Looked out for the well-being of his men and, had, and showed a total disregard for his own safety at that time. Fox's bravery in action was later vindicated in 1997 when he was later awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. It was during the, the intense fighting like this, and, and that was experienced by Fox and others, that Black 92nd GIs witnessed the activities carried out by Italian uh, partisan platoons, companies, as well as brigades who lived in the mountainous hamlets that scattered throughout the Sergio Valley. Between October and December of 1944, the Italian elements had actively engaged in attacking the German strong points along the Western front of the Fifth Army. Fighting along a, a 40, 45 kilometer um, front, they battled both German units and also the unbearable weather. And they also conducted raids against a series of fortified houses and pushed, and they continuously pushed through mortars, machine gun and small arms fire, bazookas, and also grenade uh, infested positions held by the enemy carrying out their own version of guerrilla missions. This ragtag band of friendly forces participated in sabotage work. They harassed enemy lines of communication. And they also worked steadily to neutralize German reinforcements and also uh, supply lines. They also assisted the Fifth Army as well as the OSS in gathering intelligence about German whereabouts throughout the region. And this, all of this work that was being done by these partisan forces bore fruit because by late April of the following year, 14,000 partisan uh, volunteers had successfully uh, defended the city of Genoa and, and the surrounding outposts from a substantially larger German and fascist forces, earning the praise of U.S. Army personnel ass assigned to the sector. As the men with the division moved into the, they, with the division moved into position, very few of them missed the fact that they were in, they were in, engaging a very a much larger con, uh, conflict that was brewing within war torn Italy at the time. At the Benito Mussolini unilaterally declared war on France and Great Britain, public hatred of the fascist uh, dictatorship 
lay razor thin below the surface and was expressed among many segments of the Italy civilian uh, population. At the beginning of the European war, the partisan movement in Northern Italy was divided between political and economic as well as military lines. Its anti-fascist political bands traced their genesis to the, to the groups that were organized by the socialist action and communist parties that were that that had been very active just before the fall of Mussolini. And at the same time, paralegal, basically paramilitary uh, forces were uh, composed of former members of the, Ital of the Italian army who maintained close relations with the Italian high command, but they were forced to move to the mountains when their military units were routed by the German forces that moved throughout the area. Most of the Italian people railed against the presence of German troops on their soil. What's more, partisan resistance was also fueled by the ever-burning uh, hatred expressed over the German occupation. And these feelings intensified as partisans suffered uh, violent rep reprisals at the hand of the enemy throughout the Northern Italian campaign. One example that comes readily to mind is this. During the spring of 1945, German soldiers herded uh, hundreds of Italians who lived along the, the ancient Appian Way onto, troop, on, onto trucks and drove them to nearby caves where they summarily massacred them. Afterwards, German troops dynamited the entrance to the cave dwelling so that the bodies of the villagers were never discovered. Such violent atrocities occurred with increased ferocity all of its own and culminated with the prosecution of the field marshal, Albert Kesselring, as a war criminal a few years after the, the fighting had ceased. As black troops moved throughout the, the, th through the villages that dotted the, the territory, we could only wonder what was going on in the minds of those who lived among their dwellings. And this is what fascinated me about as I was researching this, because if you think about it, many of these soldiers that were going through these areas, many of them did not, they did not speak Italian. They were not versed in basically the, 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 the cultural uh, byways of the region. But any, uh, and, and this was, would be something that would be picked up by any casual observer, right? But any observer witnessing such interactions between the, the Italian uh, civilians and black soldiers might overlook the significance of these exchanges and chalk it up to merely reflecting frequencies of power that were born during the stresses of war. However, we would be completely remiss if we didn't co consider the public and semi-public contact, the gestures, the glances, the, the words and behaviors that were expressed in battlefield uh, settings. We'll be equally dismissive, I think, if we fail to observe the manner in which the chance encounters were mediated by collective as well as individual interpretations of face-to-face -face contact and the realities and the complexities of race during times of war. The possibilities of such face-to-face -face interaction during, during the war are revealed in the experiences of Lieutenant uh, Honden Hargrove and an, Ital and an Italian villager. Throughout the spring of 1945, Honden Hargrove and soldiers with his unit had been shelling the Germans along the western uh, segment of northern Italy as the enemy launched a futile attempt to bolster its, its defenses along the Gothic line. While planning a new campaign at the B Battery headquarters uh, in the hill above Varigio, Hargrove was deep in thought when he heard what he, when, when he, heard what he thought was a, a hard rap at the door. Upon opening the door and leaving it ajar, he discovered a young Italian guerrilla armed with a carbine and two bandoliers of ammunition lurking at him in the shadows. After warily glancing at each other, the young partisan in, introduced himself as a Giovanni Murakani and explained that he, along with a, a, group, of, a group of Italian uh, partisan uh, uh, soldiers, had spent months battling German forces from their hidden stronghold lo located in the Alps. 
the days and months of fighting the enemy and the elements had taken its toll on, on the ragtag uh, band of insurgents as they slowly watched their uh, the precious supply of ammunition and food run dangerously low. And as the young rebel uh, leader recounted the struggles of, that he and his men faced, one could only imagine the palpable um, nature of the moment as each soldier stood staring uneasily at, each, at one another, each taking full measure of each other. To be sure, barriers of language, history, as well as heritage presented tremendous challenges uh, to the two soldiers. But fate, in the form of a bottle of whiskey and feelings of, of kinship expressed by Murakani, worked to forge a special bond between the two soldiers. Hargrove then scrounged up some midnight requisitions from his men and gave it to his newfound camp comrade. And after the meeting, what's significant about this is that the two men never saw each other again during the fighting. But their chance encounter and the respect and admiration that each, each man bestowed on each, uh, each other during the throes of war resonated in the memories of Hargrove, who was, a, who was at that time, it, up to his death, was a, it was a Muscogan, uh, Michigan native, and also the Italian resident long after the fighting had ceased, so much so that the two men resurrected their bonds of friendship nearly 40 years later. So that's just to give you an example of just how these gestures offhand and, and the like worked in the favor of, it, it worked in the favor of those, the, the combatants, but it also helped them to understand that to gain new meanings of what it meant to, of, in, meant to be comrades in war. As the battle scenes shifted north, uh, during the spring of 1945, the face-to-face -face encounters between Black 92nd Infantry Division soldiers and Italian villagers took a dramatic turn. Throughout March and April of that year, patrolling battalions of the 92nd worked in tandem with the men of the Brazilian Ex Expeditionary Force to, to launch a, a, an offensive through Villafranca, as well as Sissa Pass, basically directing lethal fire on German defensive positions and capturing scores of, of prisoners and equipment in the process. By the, end of, by the end of April, Allied forces led by the 370th Infantry had captured critical sites located along the Po Valley area. And also they were able to breach the, the vaunted Gothic line. On April 29th, two German officers and the, the plenipotentiary uh, general of the Warmach signed the unconditional surrender agreement uh, in Italy and the war in Italy ended uh, three days later. Shortly afterwards, members of the 92nd Infantry Division entered the, the region of Liguria where they, where they marched into Genoa and promptly established temporary billets east and west of the city. Please advance it to slide number six. This is a, a really poignant picture here because this was taken in April of 1945. And this was taken uh, of basically division members who were greeted by Genoan uh, townspeople at the time. If you notice, they're all looking, basically they're looking on at the, the servicemen quite fondly. And I think this really also captures, I think the sense of feeling and the, the, the fellowship that they had as well. Upon their arrival in the Mediterranean uh, port city, the beleaguered soldiers who had, who had survived uh, basically much of the fighting and could still walk, they received a hearty welcome from the Italian people. And as the troops marched in formation throughout the streets of Genoa in the warm springs uh, weather, many of them found themselves experiencing a mixed font of emotions. On the one hand, they were extremely relieved by the end of the fierce fighting. They were saddened by the loss of comrades and they were ecstatic that they would soon be finally going home to the warmth of family members and friends. However, they also knew that while the division's shooting battles in Northern Italy may have drawn to a close with the cessation of uh, hostilities, the, the ideological war within the war for the units, Blacks officers and enlisted men was just beginning. 
As a case in point, no sooner had the division uh, arrived in the Mediterranean metropolitan area that they became reacquainted with the all for too familiar slap of American Jim Crowism. Please advance to slide number seven. This is a slide showing a, a 92nd division member standing uh, uh, beside a sign that shows the areas where the division members were barred from entering at the time. In the days and weeks that followed the US Army's uh, occupation of the Italian region of Liguria, white officers and enlisted men worked feverishly on the a number of occasions to resurrect American segregationist policies abroad. And on, a, on more than a few occasions, they blatantly leveled discriminatory uh, measures aimed at isolating black soldiers stationed at, in, in Genoa from the Italian population. And more often than not, their efforts were couched in racist stereotype and sexual innuendo. For example, while touring the, the European uh, theater of operations as a New York Post uh, correspondent at the time, NAACP uh, Executive Secretary Walter White also found a handbill that was circulated among uh, American troops throughout Naples that was quite revealing purporting to be an, a, a Neapolitan street song and uh, basically titled Effemine Italiane So et Brasse de Negre et Americaine and sung to the tune of The Cup of Coffee. Please advance to slide number eight. Here are the lyrics of the song that were displayed in the handbill hand found by White. And I... They were in Italian. I had them translated just so you could see, but you could see basically how basically um, basically racist stereotype and innuendo circulated widely uh, throughout this period. And this is what the soldiers com were confronted with once they basically arrived in, in, in the region. White reported the handbill to the G2 branch of the Fifth Army but the significance of this the slanderous uh, campaign against black soldiers in the theater was not lost on the venerable civil rights leader. Of the vicious propaganda and its purpose, White commented, quote, it's, it's designed to steer up feelings against the association of American Negro soldiers and Italian women, in close quote. On the other hand, as division members soon discovered, young Genoan women, who encountered black troops during their stay in, in the city found themselves depicted by US military officials as loose and lascivious women or as prostitutes by merely coming into contact with them. Please advance to slide number nine. This was the case of Vernon Baker. Vernon Baker is one is who at that time was a young uh, Lieutenant with the 92nd uh, 370th Infantry and was an eventual Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, he, he is later distinguished uh, as being, in 1997, as being the only living, basically, Medal of Honor recipient from the World War II era. But while walking through the street in, in August of 1945, Baker, along with another Black officer, met a, a group of young women who struck up a casual conversation about a wide variety of topics, including life in, in the Mediterranean and conditions back in the States. While struggling to engage them with rough uh, Italian language phrases, both men expressed their satisfaction of being able to talk while strolling through the streets and to gaze at the, the ocean waves along the beaches that rested just below the, the town. However, the tender moment of gratification shared by the two GIs quickly came to an end when a military policeman approached them and said, quote, I'll have to report you two officers. While we don't have record of the immediate response of their uh, Italian hosts to the abrupt encounter, the incident left Baker deeply resentful and it stayed with the highly decorated soldier long after his military service ended. Years later, he, re he recounted, quote, the MPs had nasty habits. If a black soldier was seen walking down the street with an Italian girl, the MPs had the, the caminero, the, 
the Italian police pick up the girl and have her checked for venereal disease. It was a none too subtle way of telling an Italian woman if she was in the company of a black man, she must be a whore. And when it happened to me, it was the closest I ever came to punching a white officer, in close quote. Now, during the, their occupation of Genoa, Black GIs quickly learned that there was a noticeable dip, difference in the way they were treated by the Italians in the Mediterranean port city. For visiting soldiers like the 365th uh, Sergeant E.J. Wells, who was stationed in the Liguria region, they observed an, an, an initial reticence among uh, Italian townspeople. And that reticence in itself, I think, was born out of the curiosity of this evolving conception, their evolving conception of race altogether, and then also seeing them and trying to uh, seeing them in the context of a lot of these things that were taking place around them. A lot of they were curious, and in many ways, the relationships that were forged between Black 92nd XGIs and also Italian partisans during the heat of the fighting outdistance the di discriminatory strategies of the Jim Crow Army and survive to be eulogized through the testimonies of family, narrative, as well as monument. For example, upon receiving their discharges from the Army after the war, hundreds of Black former uh, service personnel immediately returned to the Ligurian uh, region of Italy searching for children they had fathered during the fighting. And as the 20th century drew to a close, the activities of the 92nd uh, Division and the Italian partisans became the subjects of narrative. And the story of the all black division became a screenplay and then later a Hollywood motion picture film. Finally, in, on a warm July day in 2000, seven former GIs from the 92nd Division, they made their way to Samoa Colonia to pay their respects to those who participated in the Italian uh, offensive from decades earlier. For many of them, the trip was anticlimactic for it was their first trek to the battle zone in almost 60 years. Among those present to pay homage to the living and the dead included Albert Burke, uh, Frank Cloud, Otis Zachary, and also uh, Richard Hogg, all black World War II veterans who sought to close a gut-wrenching chapter of their lives. As they slowly strove among the ruins in the, in the, the village, the ex-soldiers were now in the early 80s, but each of them remembered the, her, the, the heroic exploits of their commander, Lieutenant John Fox, who gave his life while saving countless others during the December 1944 offensive and they remembered it as if it had occurred yesterday. Among those who shared the anguish of the former Buffalo soldiers, but welcomed their return to the, the Mediterranean city, were several small uh, groups of elderly Italian war survivors. Could you advance it to slide number 10, please? This, this slide that I have for you and I'm showing you is one in which battle, basically many of the battle survivors and their family members uh, took, took place and they, they participated in. This is the Walk of Freedom. Um, and it took place in Summer Colonia in 2017. And as you can see there, there are throngs of people who are there to want to pay homage, not only to the living and the dead, but also to, I think, to erect a human monument to uh, the memory of what was actually being sacrificed and what was gained in, in the process. So could you advance one more slide? Some of the veterans, like former uh, 366 uh, infantry soldier and New York resident James Pratt, who's seen there in the center there, um, found themselves being over, overcome with emotion during these commemorative uh, events. And this picture shows Pratt standing with the mayor of Summer Colonia and also a family a survivor uh, in 2017. And it's at these commemorative uh, activities where we see the residents paying homage, they, they're honoring the returning heroes. Um, and they, they have done this now for several decades. 
to be sure the significance of these, these poignant encounters and also the memories that were invoked by the war, these memories were not lost on, their, on, on anyone. Perhaps a Soma Colonia um, villager and also one of the coordinators of the gathering may have said it best what was on the minds of everyone in the audience that day and also other days that were held in which they talked about these commemorations. When he reflected on the war to which soldiers and townspeople had devoted so much of their lives, he stated, quote, we need something to, we need something alive for the town and something alive, not a, not a museum for the dead. And in conclusion, it's within these encounters that were born in the heat, during the heat of fighting, that we as scholars may yet find new ways of understanding the Italian uh, campaign, the African-American experience in World War II, and also the Army's uh, employment of Black troops during that crucial debt period. It is one that will long stay with us and those memories will always be resurrected as a result of these encounters that they had. Thank you. So at this time, I entertain your questions. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. Okay, I'll uh, just remark to those folks that are out there participating tonight, if you have any questions, if you'll go ahead and just uh, submit them on the Q&A function. Uh, I do have one question for you right now. Uh, I think I already know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, in your research, uh, clearly you came across some, some veterans and survivors years later. So is overall, collectively, what's the, what's the attitude of these, these veterans of the 92nd in their, in their old age as they look back decades later? Well, one thing, I, I think two things stand out. Um, when you, when you talk to these veterans about their experiences, one is that they um, feel like they, they should be given their due for fighting, um, for, for, for fighting in the war and fighting uh, honorably as well as courageously during, during the war itself. They, they, they feel like sort of they have been overlooked. Um, but the other thing that they are heartened by is the fact that the public is slowly but surely turning its attention to um, not only um, their contribution to the war, but also paying attention to their, their activities and their thoughts uh, that they had at that time. You know, many of them were young people at that moment. And for them, they feel like, you know, this, this war was just like uh, other wars that African-Americans participated in in the 20th century that they, uh, they should be uh, recognized as such as basically fighting in those wars, but also to, to, for the public to draw a larger sense of what the, wars, what the war meant to them. So those two things I think are in place there. And the other thing, and I, I must emphasize this, um, they also want their family members to, um, to understand exactly what they did during the, the, this, crucial period in their lives. They, they want to share those stories with family members. Well, thank you. I'll tell you, this kind of presentation goes a long way towards achieving those kinds of things. Uh, I wanted to uh, inform you, one of our participants wrote, uh, thank you, Professor Jefferson. Uh, he just had one recommendation. He says, uh, when discussing the infantry operations, some more maps would be useful. And that's just for your edification <laughs> as you move forward. Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, okay, here, here's a question that we've got. Uh, are there any living relatives that were able to participate in the 2017 March in Somo Colonia? Um, there are actually quite a few people, um, uh, living relatives that, that participated. But you, as you know, um, the thing about this generation, we're losing so many of them. Uh, you're losing so many of them at this moment. I mean, it, the, the best, for me, I think the best way to, um, the, the, be, the best way to, to really capture um, their recollections is to look at it over a 20 year, over a 25 to 30 year period from 1990 until, until 2017 to see how many people participated and also um, 
what efforts were being made to, in order to capture the recollections. Uh, the people of Soma, uh, Soma Colonia have done that to, to a great degree by having these annual, um, by having these annual commemorative um, events occur. For instance, John Fox is, is commemorated every year. He's been commemorated for some time now in which veterans have been invited there to, to share their experiences um, and also to reconnect with the people who actually live there in the village. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing. Well, but they are, um, just to put it this way, for those who uh, have participated um, over, the, over the last 20 years, they are becoming um, scarcer because of the numbers are dwindling. We're losing so many of them. Right, absolutely. The World War II generation has truly just about passed away. And those that are remaining are very elderly and many of them don't recall things like they used to. But you know, the, the, the other side of that is, is to make a connection with, the, with their family members, basically the surviving family members, because they, in many cases, um, they have talked to them about what the, you know, their experiences in the war and what the war meant. And those kitchen, I, I must say, those kitchen table um, discussions, they are so fruitful. I mean, they, they tell you so much. They convey meaning on a lot of levels. Right, absolutely. Okay, Dr. Jefferson, we have another question. Here it is. Would you talk about General Almond's attitudes towards his soldiers? Did they change over the course of the war? Almond, um, if you if you talk to if you talk to uh, soldiers who served in the division who uh, under his command, they have some very visceral um, responses about him. Um, the, many of them are um, they felt like he. And, and I say this, he, he, he was somebody who, who um, he, he came from a different generation. He was from that World War I generation, and he was somebody who um, was accustomed to uh, commanding Black troops, but he didn't understand the troops that were under him. And that, I think that um, colored a lot of the um, decisions that he made um, in, in relation to them. And it also, um, I think it also shaped their uh, recollections of him as well. Uh, many of them, like I said before, they have very visceral, often negative things to say about him. Did he change? Did he change his outlook at all? Well, you, you know, later on he goes on to serve in the. He's there in the Korean War, right? Um, right. And and many of those soldiers. The, the ones that would go on to serve in the Korean War, they rem they they remember him from uh, from that Second World War period, and they have very caustic views about him. Um, the one thing in this paper that 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 I did not talk about was that much of the experiences of the men who served of many of the men who served in this division were buffeted by. Um, a lot of the, the, the racism that they perceive coming up from the, the higher command and th their perceptions of the, the, the racial attitudes of their commanders had a definite impact on how they saw military service and how they saw, in, in connection to that, American democracy. They became more, I think they became more um, committed and devoted to American democracy after seeing those di those direct contrasts that were there, and Almond helped to draw those contrasts, I believe. Okay, I have another question for you. How much interaction did the men of the three seventieth three seventieth three seventieth have with the Nisai soldiers of the four forty second? How did they get along? Well. You know, what's really interesting is that one of my um, colleagues, uh, Tom Guglielmo, has written a book called Divisions, in which he talks about the interaction between Black soldiers um, and the basically those who served, the Nisei that served uh, un, basically with them. You know, the Nisei um, were, the 442nd was a part of the, uh, of the 92nd Division. And 
they were slated. Um, they, they fought. Uh, there was is first of all is the is the most highly decorated unit in the Second World War, but they also fought. Um, they they also uh, got a chance to fight alongside those who many of those who served in the division, and they had they they, they thought about them as being basically brothers in arms, but they also kept them at arm's length. If I had to describe it any other way, um, they had a grudging respect for them. And those and the soldiers who fought with them, they were just as proud to basically be a part of that unit as they were uh, as basically being serving in the war. Okay, well, it, it clearly attests to the positive impact that the service of both of those units had for both the Army and the Greater American Society. And I think it's uh, for me personally hearing you say that. Uh, Many of these veterans that came back from the 370th actually developed an attitude of wanting to better our democracy based upon their experiences and perhaps spread what they felt was their, their birthright here in the United States. I, I personally find that to be very profound and frankly gratifying. You know, the other thing, and let me add another thing to this, is that World War II ended up being the crucible for basically what we know of as American democracy. Um, it, 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 became, it, it became the anvil for hammering out those ideas about what, what, what true equality could be, right, um, it, here in this country. And I think those soldiers were basically the shock troops for testing that, for testing those ideas. Absolutely. Well, as you and I were discussing prior to the presentation, there's no question that there, there's just countless opportunities for further research and scholarship. Uh, and one could argue particularly in terms of social history uh, with our veterans and uh, even the civilian workforce, women, minorities in the workplace and so on. And I think it's refreshing that we have these kinds of things coming out now, again, to broaden, expand and hopefully make better our democracy. Yeah. So I think when we look at it through the lens of, of our, the contemporary uh, times that we live, democracy is always being tested. And it is during times of emergency that you really see, uh, OK, what do, it, be, it becomes like a laboratory in which all of these ideas are being um, they're, they're being bandied about, they're being discussed, they're being debated. And for those in uniform, they, I think they have these ongoing discussions about what this is all about, probably more so than we do as civilians. Well, as a, as a retired soldier, I can tell you they do. That's something that the soldiers discuss all the time because they're right in the middle of it. So Dr. Jefferson, in closing, I just wanted to ask you, uh, again, you and I were talking prior to the presentation, what you alluded to it, uh, what, what is your next project? What are you looking at next? Well, we're talking about democracy. I think one of the, I think one of the places where um, this type of uh, discussion was taking place was in the, the 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 officer candidate schools of World War II. People don't understand. They, I don't think they realize it, but those officer candidate schools were integrated. They were desegregated during the Second World War, and for a number of reasons. One, um, th there were there are only so many places in, um, in, in the United States where the type of the training of officers could take place. Plus, I think there was also, uh, there was a push from basically black organizations, civil rights organizations, as well as leaders and the press to have basically African-Americans being included in the training of the, the officer corps. They pushed from the very beginning. And this happened almost almost haphazardly. Um, it's one of the, I think it's like one of the untold success stories of the war that we, we haven't even explored yet. Well, sir, I will tell you, I'm an officer candidate school graduate and I'm pretty well read on World War II and I had no idea that OCS was integrated in World War II. So I think that's that right there is uh, an opportunity for something. Uh, I guarantee you that is probably not very widely known. Um, well, sir, we need to close. I just want to uh, 
We got one last comment from someone who says, uh, thank you for an informative presentation, much appreciated. I uh, suggest that uh, everyone who attended tonight feels that way. I know I found your presentation particularly informative and enlightening. Certainly, uh, Jermaine, right now, today, to the United States and all our people, and uh, on behalf of all of us here at the Ormandy Herod Center Foundation, I wanna thank you for a wonderful presentation and hope that we'll see you again. And as we discussed, if you're back in uh, Carlisle, please stop in the office and see us. You will see me soon here. All right, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, again, that concludes it. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We hope that you'll join us again. And to all, I wish you a good evening. Good night, sir. Good night.